morning, everyone, and a happy National Day long weekend. I uh, hope you're having a great morning or afternoon, depending on your time zone. Um, let me start by introducing myself. Uh, my name is John, and I'll be one of two moderators for this morning. Very excited about some of the content we've got to share with you. Um, so shortly, I'll introduce the other, man, uh, the other moderator and panelists. Um, I'm here, in terms of my introduction, I'm here of one of several volunteers at the Asia Institute of Mentoring. And if you do have a passion for mentoring or would like to be a mentor or a mentee or a volunteer with us, more information will be provided at the end of this fireside chat. So today's fireside chat is part of our United Against COVID-19 series. This covers three main pillars. The first one is crisis management. The second one is career resilience. And the third one is personal well-being. As you're now part of our mailing list, you'll, see, you'll receive invites to these events. Please feel free to join um, to any of them and we'll provide more details of how you can do that later. So why are we here on this Saturday morning, I hear you asking yourself. Well, we're here because somebody or something is out there killing our creativity. Someone is murdering our creative chakras and it's time to find out who. And I'd like to introduce the second moderator for today's event and, and this lady is Delphine Ang, you'll see there on the video. And by way of introduction, Delphine has over 20 years experience developing and managing events in Asia and the Middle East. Delphine is a bridge builder, people connector, community developer and platform creator. She focuses on creating and organizing people focused and heart oriented programs that serve to inspire and transform people's lives. Her passion is to bring families and communities together, teens, youths and parents through seminars that serve to equip them with important life skills that empower them to thrive against adversity, to build and enjoy strong relationships. Hi Delphine, would you like to introduce us to the morning fireside chatters please? Hi, good morning everyone. It's an honor and privilege to be here. And it is also my uh, great, great pleasure to introduce my two good friends whom I have known for like at least 15 years. Although I do have a formal introduction that I'd like to read to you. So if you could spare me some time. So the two, my two friends are Jaya, Jaya and Andrew. So Dr. Jaya Grant is an adjunct researcher and lecturer at the University of Sydney Business School, who has developed a unique innovation change leadership profile measure to assist developing future ready leaders, to assist future ready leaders. Mm -hmm. Jaya has presented keynotes on her research into ambidextrous leadership to clients like Gartner, Gartner Sales, YPO, Hargreaves, and a number of government bodies, along with the top ranking Academy of Management and European Group of Organization Studies events. And now Andrew, in case you guys are wondering, they are actually husband and wife. So Andrew Grant has been a professional keynote speaker with, and consultant for the last 20 years, headlining international conferences for market leaders, including Mercedes-Benz, ST Lauder, Boeing, Four Seasons, Hotel, Four Seasons Hotels, Nestle and Salesforce, along with a number of major financial organizations. He is a TEDx, YPO, APEC CEO Summit speaker. So welcome, Andrew and Jaya. Welcome, and guys. Thank you for having us. So, so guys, before we, um, we kick off the, the poll, um, welcome and thanks for taking the time out to share the, your knowledge and experience um, with, the, with the people on the, the webinar this morning. Um, the poll itself is going to have a couple of questions uh, and then we'll get into some discussion around the poll results. And so people on the webinar are about to launch the poll now. Um, if you can um, answer the questions as quickly as possible. There are no right and wrong answers. For those in Singapore, this isn't a test. Um, so please make sure that you answer them and uh, let's see what interesting results we get. And don't I'm worry, launching. we haven't started any tests on creativity. Exactly. Okay, you should be seeing the poll in front of you now. Okay, I'll start to see some of the results as you're clicking on the buttons. Okay, here we go, starting to come in. So 25%, 30% of you have answered, here we go. Interesting. So 
So 70%. Come on, the slow coaches. Let's get these questions answered. Right, okay. I'm going to close the poll off in 10 seconds. Let's have a look at some of these results. Um, I, I think there's some interesting results for you here, guys. And um, so in question one, do you think you were more creative as a kindergarten, as a child, or now as an adult? Well, 55% um, say kindergarten and a massive 48%. Oh, it's changing, still, still voting. 53% and 48%. So 53% think kindergarten and 48% think now as an adult. So, um, and with the second one, uh, what do you think are the two biggest creativity killers? Select three from the multiple choice. Um, the three largest ones were um, number one with 67% was fear. Um, number two uh, with 55% was narrow-mindedness. And number three with 45% was control. So welcome, um, Jaya and Andrew. What have you got to say about those results? Well, I, very interesting. That is a little bit unusual for the children in kindergarten because uh, the statistics show that 98% of us were creative as children and creative own, geniuses. Creative geniuses <laughs> and only 2% of us are creative as adults. So the overwhelming research shows that whilst many of us were extremely creative as children, Unfortunately, we seem to have lost that, and that definitely got us on that road of why we wrote the book, Who Killed Creativity and How to Get It Back, and got us thinking about why we should be addressing this issue, because everyone's telling us we need to be creative. We'll talk later on about why that's important as an adult, and yet we've discovered in our research, not this research, because uh, that 98% of adults are not, but here we are saying that 45% of you have said you're more creative which as an is, adult. Which is great. I think we've attracted a creative audience. Did, wait, an up, or an you up, had a very um, uncreative kindergarten. An, an I, don't update on the, which, uh, I don't know which one it's going to say more about. Or you have about. a very creative workplace, which is an great. Update, <laughs> an update on the poll as well. It's actually gone to 50-50. Oh, well, that is, that is <laughs> oh, a very wow. first. It's and, highly um, unusual. As Jay has said, you could do the half cup half full or cup half empty. Either you had very... Very, very not, very, very not creative kindergartens, or you're all very creative people, and we seem to have protracted the creative ones who are waking up on a Saturday morning to do this. Let's hope it's the latter. And and what about the um, the multiple choice questions? So that the numbers where we say narrow mindedness. Uh, so fear number one, yeah. narrow minded number two, and control number three. That actually fits with the psychology, and the psychological research says that fear is actually a foundational challenge for most human beings and that is what shuts down our creative capacity so if we we talk scientifically what is happening physically is when we're in fear we go into fight or flight mode so we're, we're not able to be creative and the the primitive part of our brain is where we start to function from so the the, the um the neuro neuroscience is that the the neurology is blocked so the, the neurons can't spark through to the prefrontal cortex, which is where we do our most logical and creative thinking. And we don't have that capacity to, to really explore different options effectively. So our brain shuts down effectively, going to that freeze state. And um, there's a lot of interesting science about that, the corticosteroids that are released and how they can um, actually kill brain cells, particularly in the hippocampus, which is where we have um, memories stored. And that's where we start with our creative thinking. And we can, you know, that sort of anxiety, that survival focus can lead to moodiness, self-interests, and it can really impact our brain. So Andrew's just put up some, um, an image there, which is looking at how our brains get triggered. So fear is definitely at, at the heart of a lot of that. And it's closely related to control because a lot of our fears come from being controlled or perceiving that we have. Well, one of the um, fun things about writing the book is we were, we were trying to work out which one is the big mafia boss. I mean, as I said, we've come up with seven things that block creativity. Um, and it is really interesting when we do the workshops or have discussions to try and ask people, does, does fear create control or does control create fear? But the neuroscientist that we wrote the book with um, when we asked him, he, he believed that fear was the one that was, as Jay said, the most underlying one. And that is because when we're in a state of fear, we go into that fight, flight or freeze mode. And 
that draws the resources from the front of our brain, which is the more creative part of the brain, to the more primitive part of the brain. And, and therefore, you've only got a certain amount of bandwidth. Now, that was great when we were designed to run away from uh, issues, run away from emergency situations. But my challenge to most of us in the workplace is how many times are we living in that workplace where we're living in a constant state of fear, mm. a constant state of fight, flight, or freeze. That stress. Yeah, and, and it, releasing it, it was only, it's right, it was only meant for a short period of time. As it a survival was, mechanism. As a, yeah, and, and, yet, and yet we sadly are living uh, in, a, in it regularly. So one of the things we need to think about is if we're serious about being creative, and this is why we wrote the book, how do we get rid of the killers? There are so many books and YouTube videos and steps and brochures on how to be creative, but, and, and so many companies that jump straight into, let's, let's give everyone pizza and Coke on a Friday night and do a hackathon and, 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 and do design thinking, but none of them address the neurological issues that we have in our minds that's saying, I'm not creative because, and it could be because of one of these seven killers. Mm. I was going to add too, because the third one that came up was uh, narrow-mindedness. So that fear and that control can actually sort of shut down the different, um, it, can, it can prune the different um, pathways, neurological pathways in the brain, and it can shut down our thinking, our openness to new ideas, so that we become very channeled in our thinking and we stick to habitual pathways which become, can become highways of thinking instead of um, being open to, to different options and exploring different options and continuing to learn. So that's really the next step after fear and control. So I think, you know, the audience has picked up on some of the key issues. And, sure. and, ha and having, having done this, you know, obviously, across the globe, do you, do you typically see um, any difference between the regions that you go to present this material in? Well, it was very interesting when I, you know, I've, I've feel like I've, I won't say kept Singapore Airlines afloat, but spent a lot of time traveling to Singapore and we lived in Indonesia for 15 years. So we're not going to be experts on, on, on different cultures, but we've certainly lived there long enough. And I must say, when I talk to um, millennials in Silicon Valley that say they work for a startup, they're very excited to run home and tell their parents they're working for a startup. But unfortunately, mm -hmm. if anyone gets a job for a startup in Singapore, they're not as keen to run home and tell their parents they're working for a startup. I think they'd be more happy to tell their parents they're working for the government. So <laughs> there, is, um, there is definitely a difference in culture. Or a big bank. In, or a big bank. <laughs> there is definitely, definitely a difference in culture between uh, risk appetite and, you know, they're, they're both, both can have their pros and cons, but they're some of the differences that we've seen. Jaya. And, and a lot of that comes down to the education system. So whatever the education system is teaching, is it teaching empowerment? Is it teaching independent thinking? Is it encouraging self-discovery and self-learning? If it is, then you will have more creativity because people feel that freedom. They, they don't have that fear to express themselves. Um, but if, if the education system is not encouraging those things, if it's more based on rote learning and you know, learning the, the, just the literacy and numeracy skills, and rather than focusing on, on exploring, playing, and opening up to creative thinking, then it will impact creativity. So those cultures that have different education systems will see creativity expressed differently. Inter interesting. Uh, uh, Delphine. Yeah, so I was gonna ask that, uh, can you dispel some myths around creative thinking? Because when the word creative, um, comes up, people are trying to think like, oh, I'm not creative, I'm not good at drawing. And we have uh, people as uh, participants who are from finance, like tech, they might be thinking, what has it got to do with my department? I mean, the last thing you want is for the finance or the legal people to get creative. We love that challenge <laughs> because <laughs> everybody has the capability to cre be creative. Everyone was creative as a child. Um, and we just need to tap back into that. And everyone needs to be creative because we're not going to survive. And in every, every single sector, we need to be creative yeah. because um, creative thinking is not just about looking to the clouds and being imaginative. It's not just about being artistic. It's much deeper than that. It's mm -hmm. actually being able to think differently about issues and challenges to face up to wicked problems that seem impossible to solve 
and come up with really different, unique solutions. And so we all have to be able to do that. What's also um, unique about creative thinking is typically we've thought about um, creative products and, and outcomes or innovation as an outcome without realizing that if you want innovation, which everyone says is really important, then you have to have creative thinking. So you have to have creative mindsets. You need creative people who um, uh, have the creative thinking skills. You need creative thinking processes and models. You need to build creative systems and structures in organizations. So there's a lot of myths around that, that it's just this creative product uh, that emerges from somewhere without thinking through, well, there's a whole lot behind that that we need to be focusing on. But Delphine, you're right. Um, one of our first clients and our biggest clients have been the banks. Mm. And this was 20 years ago. They came to us and said, look, we need these problems solved. Now, they didn't know to ask for creative thinking. They just said, we need these problems solved. Can you help facilitate that process? So I didn't come in saying, I'm going to teach you about creative thinking because 20 years ago, if I'd said that, they would have been freaked out that we were going to hold hands, play guitar around a campfire and stare at clouds and sing Kumbaya and hope that a creative idea will come to us. And I think, unfortunately, that's what was all on offer back then. You either had the really arty-farty hippie side of creativity or nothing, or linear problem solving. And one of the reasons I believe we became so successful so early, particularly with the more traditional large multinationals, was we were offering intelligent solutions to their problems. So we were saying, this is, here's the irony, a creative process. Well, the banks love the word process. Um, we're not going to stare at clouds and wait for the idea to come. We're going to give you a seven-step process of how you can take what Jay mentioned, a wicked problem, which is a problem like COVID. We don't know where it came from. We don't know what's it going to do and where it's, where it's going to go, rather than a linear problem, and try and put that through a methodology to come out with a better idea, uh, quicker, um, more efficient, uh, often cheaper. These things all require creative thinking. They're not linear approaches. And they are often about taking one idea from over here and one idea from over here that are totally unrelated and coming together to come up with something better. And once we could explain that to these more traditional companies and say that, look, here's what we're going to do. We're going to solve a problem for you. Um, they love it. Now, Delphine, you know, we worked with a large logistics company last year. Yeah. They were, um, you know, saying, well, what do we do with empty containers? We often, we've often, we often got empty containers going out. How do we fill them? Now, they were thinking down the lines of logistics, and we were thinking, well, hang on. What has AirAsia and, and Silk um, and Scoot done? They, they, they're, they're selling us seats as we get on the plane. If we want an extra seat, they're constantly selling us that dead stuff that can't be used once the plane's taken off. Now, AI can't automate that process for, for a logistics company, but a creative person can go outside the logistics company's um, boundaries and say, let's use a model from AirAsia or Scoot Airlines and apply it into the logistics. And all of a sudden, the CEO is going, my gosh, why didn't we think of this? It, it seemed to make so much sense. And now they're realizing that they can use every square meter of their containers to some capacity. That was creative thinking, and that has, has, has given them a whole new revenue stream that they didn't have before. Very different to artistic style of creativity. Very, very yeah. interesting. I, I'm constantly asking my accountant to be creative. It, it doesn't well, seem to be Well, that was called working. the GFC, so I'd be careful with that one. Uh, the banks did try that, and uh, obviously we need a few boundaries around what creativity means. <laughs> Yeah, and creative doesn't mean that you have to be original. You could be looking at an idea that someone already has and you put it into a new situation to solve a new problem. Absolutely. Right. And, you know, at the end of the day, there's not many original ideas around. Inventors uh, it, always build on yeah. other people's ideas. So, so uh, yeah. for, the, for example, the printing press uh, didn't just emerge in Europe in, in, in the Middle, middle Ages. Gutenberg actually gathered the ideas from different places. So the, the typeface came from China and the ink came from Egypt and everything came together as a printing press eventually. But each genius is building on the ideas of, um, of the shoulders of those before them. But then that required the right environment because, as I said, he didn't build the printing mm -hmm. press and, and you could almost say Steve Jobs didn't invent the iPhone and it barely contains an Apple part. But it was the genius of bringing everything together and that requires a very specific mindset for the individual or a very specific culture for the company. As I said, you can't just throw people together on a Friday night and have a hackathon. You have to create a creative environment. 
one large finance company or insurance company we went to in Singapore, he took me up to the top of his building and said, here's our multi-million dollar innovation lab. And it looked absolutely fantastic. And we walked around it and saw all the beanbag chairs and the color posters. And, and then he took me into the side room and said, but it's not working. And I said, why is it not working? He said, well, the boss still takes the corner desk and people are still not collaborating and we're still not coming up with collaborative ideas. And I had to say, but this is, you've spent all this money on the hardware. How much money have you spent on, and I don't particularly like the word training, but how much money have you spent on developing your staff to help them understand what they had as a child, of which they don't have now? What have you done for the creativity side? Oh, we haven't quite got to that yet. So as I said, you can't just throw a lot of money at people and a lot of time and tell them to do, do it. Leaders need to create a culture that allows creativity to flourish and leaders need to create a culture that attracts creative people. If we've got a lot of startup people on this call, how, what are you doing to attract, and there's a war for talent. What are you doing to attract the most creative people in your country to come and work for you and not your competitor? And there's a question I'm not gonna answer. I'm gonna leave that up to you. How are you attracting the creative class? Now, I think Singapore's doing an amazing job in Asia, sucking the creative class out of the rest of Asia. Um, and, and there's reasons why they're doing that. They're putting the environment, they're putting long-term strategies in place to ensure that they're making the people that are creative wanting to live there. Very clever. So, so, so Andrew, I, I mean, um, you know, you talked about uh, fear being a major component in terms of what kills creativity and, and obviously with everything that's going on at the moment, um, how is that likely to be impacting creative with, with obviously people losing um, jobs and redundancies and everything else uh, and you know more anxiety than ever before. So can you talk us through what the likely impact of that is based on your research? Absolutely. Um, it's, it's going to create a lot of fear for individuals, which will make them a lot more conservative in their decisions. So people will become more risk averse because there are consequences. So where, where there are no consequences, where you have a safe environment in a particular work context, you might be able to explore and you might be able to fail more. And, and everybody talks in, in innovation about how we need to fail often and fail well. Um, but you can't afford to fail sometimes if, if you're you know, facing loss of a job or loss of income or you know, loss of a house or whatever it is, you have to become more conservative. So that's really certainly challenging. But at the same time, you have to sort of force yourself to say, all right, I, I might need to be conservative about my decisions, but I still need to be creative about my thinking. Because unless I'm thinking of the different options, the different alternatives, unless I'm exploring all the different pathways that could be open to me, I won't necessarily come up with the best solution. So perhaps there's a different way to earn income. Perhaps you can talk about, you know, cutting back to part time, there, there might be several different ways that you can approach a problem. And this is part of what creative thinking is about. It's, it's about saying, you know, there's no, not necessarily always a black and white, a right and wrong. There can be lots of shades of gray and we need to, to look at all those different but, options. But you can take the risk out of creative thinking. This is the irony of it. If you go through a, as I said, we've got a, a seven step process in the second half of our book, seven very, very clear strategies that are, that are linear, as in the sense that they follow through step one, step two, step. If you follow that process carefully, the first part of that process is the creative thinking, which is the generating ideas and making sure the divergent thinking, you go as high as possible to get the very, very best ideas, not the first one that comes into your head. But that's not the end of the book or the workshop or what we offer. You then need to transition people into critical thinking, saying, right, now we've got these top three ideas which are the ones that are most likely going to work? And then you have to take them through a critical thinking process, the what ifs, the scenario plannings, where could they go wrong? I mean, how many of the big companies recently have launched products that have, you know, that the reviewers have told them it doesn't work or it's not waterproof or the battery explodes or you can't peel the plastic off a folding phone? I would have thought, you know, that, that, that should have been done in the prototyping stage, in the testing stage. So if you do follow a clear process, I mean, the, the, the latest buzzword now is design thinking, but the, it's been around since the 60s. If you follow that clear process and go into the divergent thinking first to make mm -hmm. sure you come up with the best idea and then bring it down into the critical thinking to make sure you come up with the best idea that will actually work and anticipate all the things that go wrong, and it is a seven-step process, then it actually will minimize the risk. Mm -hmm. 
to make sure that you're not releasing a something that's not going to work in the marketplace. But look, none of us can sit still at the moment with what's going on. We have to reinvent ourselves. It may we may be paralyzed by fear and say, well, we can't do anything. But what's the alternative? We just sit back and let the world pass us by. We all have to reinvent ourselves. So I think using this creative process that we've designed is, or, or, and it's not just us. I mean, there's plenty around, but obviously we like the one we've designed. <laughs> using the creative process that we've come up with is, is to me the safest way to make sure you can reinvent yourself as we transition into a year where we don't know where it's going. We don't know what the outcome is going to be. What's the alternative to sit still and let the world take us by? So, some great advice there. And we'll, we'll ask a question from the audience. Um, keep your questions coming in, guys, through the Q&A section. Um, so question from the audience, and, and as, as is the case in Singapore, straight to the solution. What if I'm surrounded by toxic, non-creative superiors? <laughs> Sell them a workshop. <laughs> Buy them the book for well, Christmas. Well, I saw somebody yeah. mentioned leadership, and leadership is critical. It's very hard to be creative if the leadership style, leadership approach uh, is not creative. If there's not support for creative ideas, if there's not a creative environment that's been established in an organisation. Uh, there's a couple of answers to that. You still can do what you can do within your realm of control. So with your own peers, with your own work, workmates, um, with the way you approach your own work, uh, you can still be creative. You can sort of, you know, shut yourself off from that toxic environment if possible. Well, first of all, you've got but, to be aware of, I mean, I mean, the first thing is to identify the toxic environment. That, yeah. That's the challenge. We, we, and and oh, the impact that it has on, on you. On you, yeah. I mean, you can't... to know whether, you know, there's, there's just nothing you can do or whether you can still work within that. I mean, a lot of people come to our workshops <laughs> and the only feedback is, I wish my boss had done it. Yeah. Um, because he's the one controlling me. So what we need to think for people to do is, as Jay has said, if, if you're in that environment and you, like Stephen Covey says, you've only got a circle of influence that you can control, then you've got to start thinking about uh, what is blocking my creativity? Is it when I go to the boss's office, I freeze up with fear? And then rather than give the boss a lecture on that he needs to do this course, you can say, well, what, what do I need to do to prepare myself when I'm going to the boss's office? What yeah. level of resilience and optimism do I need if the boss is going to shut me down every time I come up with a creative idea? Look, eventually yeah. leave and get another job, but that's too easy said Or as Andrew said, actually, you know, recommend that they do workshops, education, and try to change the culture if you can. And I'll give you an example of um, where we were able to have success in a toxic culture. So I worked with an agribusiness and uh, the, the CEO of that business was actually quite innovative and he just didn't understand why other people in the organisation weren't coming up with innovative ideas. So I sat in on one of their um, executive meetings and I watched how people were interacting with each other. And I saw that when a member of a team brought up a creative idea, they were actually quite hesitant. They said it hesitantly, and then they'd look over to the side to watch for the boss's reaction. And the boss crossed his arms, sat in the corner, and he was quite stony-faced. And then he'd say, oh, we've done that before, or we don't have the budget for that, or, you know, why try that? It won't work. And he had no idea that he was actually shutting down those creative ideas. And, and I could see throughout the organisation that there was a general fear of expressing crea a creative idea in case it got shut down. So he thought he had a creative organisation. He didn't understand why there was this fear and why people weren't coming up with the ideas. So I was fortunately able to work with him. I was able to coach him and teach him that how his reactions came across to others and the impact it had on their creative thinking and on the culture. And I was able to then run workshops with um, the leadership team to help them to understand their interactions better and all through the organisation to help individuals to, to build that creative confidence and that assertiveness. And so you can make a difference. But, but the question was, what do you do if you can't get to that if boss? My, my, <laughs> my suggestion is, is you go through that creative process yourself. You go through the seven steps. And when you want to present an idea to your boss who, let's say, is totally risk averse and maybe comes from a, you know, a more numbers background, auditing background, uh, and is not open to that, then you, you can't present him with some silly, stupid pie in the sky idea. You have to go to him and say, look, we've gone through this seven step process and we've brought it down to this one and we believe it'll work because, and, and you need to alleviate his fear. 
he's being killed by creativity because of control, fear, narrow-mindedness. But unfortunately, you're not his mm -hmm. psychologist, so you can't tell him what to do. So you will need to come to him and, and or pre her. or her. <laughs> unfortunately, often it is a him. Um, uh, come to them and, and preempt what, you know, a part of it is how can you creatively present your idea in a way that they will accept it. And if you come in and say, look, I had a dream last night at two o'clock in the morning that we're going to do this, this and this, he'll show you the door. But if you say to him, look, I've, I've come up with this idea, I've gone through this seven step process, I've prototyped it, I've tested, I've thought of all the things that could go wrong, what do you think of it? Then, then you're winning his confidence over. And you've got to keep in mind too that a lot of these CEOs are in fear of the board. So they've got We've to answer got <laughs> to someone else. So, and, and they're thinking, well, I've only got a short tenure. What can I achieve in that time? I can't take risks. So, you know, everybody's got a reason for but, reacting the way I, they do. I'll just tell you one other, yeah, one other quick story that comes to mind is we had a, a boss engage us for a um, creative workshop and mm. going through the seven steps, he had his top 20 people in the room and then he said, um, gave us a great introduction like Delphine, but then he said, enjoy your training. I'll see you in two days time. And first of all, I hate the word training. Uh, and secondly, I can't believe he had his top 20 people in the room and he thought he, he didn't need it. He could go away and come back at the end. And of course he went away, which was probably good for everyone else because they breathed a sigh of relief because he was a control freak. Um, and we came up with hundreds and hundreds of great ideas and they were all around the room. And he came back and we were at the, at the end of day two, we were going to present the best ideas. But as soon as he walked in the room and saw the hundreds of ideas, you could see he freaked out. Um, and, and the problem is he wasn't part of the process to show that in order to get to the best ideas, you have to go through all the crappy ones. And he didn't realize that. So before we even got to present the good ideas to him, he'd already tuned out because he was so freaked out when he saw all these you know, stupid ideas. And many of them were stupid ideas but you don't get to the good ideas if you're not prepared to go through those. So yeah. I was concerned that he didn't appreciate the process. And that was a real learning for me. Great. So some, some great answers and great advice there. Uh, Delphine. Yeah. So what can we all do to be more creative? I think I would actually like to ask actually, um, as a leader, how do you actually encourage creativity? Because we do have a lot of business leaders and HR leaders and they would like to know how do I inject creativity into my organization? How do I develop a culture of creativity? Well, I think it starts by acknowledging that, that there needs to be a culture. This is, this is my, my biggest concern. Um, when we wrote the book, Wiley, the publisher came to us and said, another book on creativity proved to us this is worth publishing what have you got to offer differently to anyone else? So we had to do a lot of research to find out what was already out there because no publisher wants to publish another seven steps on creativity. There's already 10,000 of them. Um, and so we thought, well, what's missing? And as we went into our workshops, again, particularly with banks teaching them design thinking, many of them would say, this is a great workshop, but it's not for me. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not the creative person in my company. This is for someone else. Why am I here? And so we started collecting all these excuses and reasons and issues that people had with, it's not my responsibility, this is someone else's. And that's when we put them into seven, what we call killers, and then ran them past our neuroscientists and psychologists to say what's going on in the brain, to realize if we want to be creative, we have to start with what's stopping us being creative. What are the things that, that we might have had as a children, as children for the average person, not you guys, um, and what's happened in our journey over the last 20, 30 years is we've gone from being that inquisitive, curious, fearless child to now sitting there going, I can't do this, I can't do this, I'm crippled by creativity. And so that's why we, it was really important to preempt a workshop, preempt a half of the book with looking at these psychological and neuroscientific reasons for the things that block creativity. Of course, we've called it Who Killed Creativity because none of us wanted to write a book on creativity and not be creative. So, so forgive us for being creative and turning it into a metaphor, but we didn't want to be hypocrites and just talk about the seven psychological blocks of creativity. We want you to enjoy it and remember it as, as participants do. But I think it's really important that if we want to be creative, we have to start with a diagnostic. What's happened to us? Why were we so creative as children? If you've got children on this call, go and look at their creativity and then compare them to you. And we may not get a 50-50 if you start comparing yourself to your children, looking at their curiosity, their inquisitiveness, their, their willingness to explore and try over and over again. 
I mean, it's interesting. Uh, sorry. Um, there was one time there was this guy at your workshop because I had to co facilitate the workshop. He came out and he said, I think I'm very creative. And he gave himself like 90 over percent. And then when he did the, the creative test and he scored like one out of seven. And then he, he thought to himself, oh gosh, I got to start paying attention because a lot of times some people may have a overrated um, belief in themselves. And is that a good thing or bad thing to be? You well, know, that's optimism, but I don't know. <laughs> if, you, if, if you're blind to your own mistakes, that, 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 that's the beauty of a diagnostic, isn't it? Or 360, when yeah. we play the board game. So we've developed a board game and there's a virtual version as well as a physical version. But when we play the board game, the reason we've made the board game is we've got the characters and the weapons and the rescuers, and we want people to be able to sit behind the characters. Nobody's going to go to their boss and say, you're killing my creativity, um, or even reflect on themselves what's killing my creativity. But as Delphine pointed out, if we do a CQ, um, a fun CQ test, if we play a board game where we throw the characters out on the board and say, okay, tell me what you think, you know, who killed creativity with what weapon and where, which is kind of the fun side of it. Um, then we then we start, we are first of all being playful in the way we're doing it. So that lowers people's guards. And secondly, it allows people to hide behind characters and start to explore uh, parts of creativity that they wouldn't have had in that relationship between their HR director or between their boss, because we're doing it as a, as a ga gamification. So people let their guard down and they tend to play it more. Uh I've also developed a more rigorous validated assessment. So we've got some- This is the <laughs> educational and the academic speaking, but go ahead. And we combine both. <laughs> so um, as, along with that, you know, we have lots of exercises that we do to help people un, uh, un discover what's underlying their fears and their challenges and to bring those to the surface. But then I've developed a, a validated survey and it's called the Innovative Change Leadership Inventory or, or the ICLI. And that is a way of sort of teasing out what are the particular areas of challenge. So it's going to come out if it's fear, then you need to develop more um, freedom in thinking. And how do you do that? We talk about strategies in the book. You know, if, 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 um, you know, if there's too much freedom, sometimes you might need a little bit more control. So how do you develop more guidelines and, and your, your creative thinking process? We talk about that in the book. So there's a lot of... Um, you know, strategies that once you've identified what are the particular areas of challenge for you, then what can you do about that? And how right. can you build a complementary team? And how can you maximize your strengths, fill in the gaps, etc.? That's interesting. So and I'm going to go to a couple of questions from, um, from the audience. We've got some great questions coming in. It's a very, very engaged uh, group. And I, I was reading in your, uh, I was actually listening to your book, I should say, not reading because I'm too lazy. Um, I was listening to your book and, and one of the things that struck me, and especially for younger people, if I think about myself growing up, you know, the, the idea that it takes 25 minutes of uninterrupted time before you even engage creativity. One of the questions along that line is, so how, with your expertise, um, how do you bring creativity in young leaders? You know, they've got all of this input from, you know, uh, WhatsApp, from Telegram, from Facebook, from Instagram, from all of this. How do you actually bring out that creativity if people are being constantly interrupted? Mm, and I think you've said it really well there. Because we know from the research, Mikhail Csikszentmihalyi and his book Flow, which is really interesting to read, uh, talks about that research that we need 25 minutes to get into a creative state of flow. So we need to be uninterrupted to get our best ideas and so, have so that those breakthrough people, new that, ideas. That means some people could go days, weeks, hours, months, years. Because you're constantly <laughs> being interrupted. And, and I, I won't even say how many times a day that is, but we know, you know, the statistics are extremely high. It's more than 25 And minutes. we're told, we actually believe that multitasking is good. We think it's a, a, it's a, it's a good capability to have without realising that our brains are not built to multitask. In fact, every time we try to change tasks and neural pathways, we're trying to switch from one neural pathway to another. And it's like we have to stop um, and then shift and then get into the new flow. And we're interrupting our, our creative capabilities in that way. We can't perform well. And in fact, the impact of, of multitasking has twice as much impact on killing brain cells as smoking marijuana. So both should be banned in <laughs> Singapore. So... <laughs> Yeah, multitasking is is a bad drug in a sense, in, in the impact in, in the sense of the impact on the brain. 
and we need to be really careful of that. And look, we're so, not saying don't do. We're not saying don't do it. I mean, that person that asked that question, you know, you don't say, or you don't say to your boss, uh, "Don't bother me for three hours. I'm being creative." That might not go down too well either, <laughs> because that's a great excuse to say, "I'm turning my email off," but you'll probably still be on your WhatsApp and Messenger and Instagram. But the point is, we're saying it, each of us needs to take control over our own flow, uh, particularly if we're working from home where the distractions just can go on forever. And if you don't want to be creative, that's fine. You know, go ahead and be interrupted every, 20, every, every few minutes. Um, it also I, impacts well, productivity. Well, that's well. what I'm saying. Well, AI, memory, if, you don't want to, if you don't want to be creative, just bear in mind AI will take over your job shortly. <laughs> so, you know, if you want to be creative, you need to start now. And that may start with saying, gosh, I'm going to try 26 minutes to, to, um, to not be interrupted. And watch what happens in that last minute of the, of the 26th <laughs> minute. And that's why people say they have their creative ideas when they're sleeping, when they're in the shower, until we can bring waterproof phones into the shower. Um, but hey, you know, they've now invented an iPad porta potty. So Delphine, I know you've got a young child, you know, you can stick your child on the, on the porta potty and give them an iPad and not even in the toilet now can people uh, have a, <laughs> dare I say, a breath of fresh air, <laughs> but not even the toilet now can we have that, 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 that reserve thinking time. Not that any of us spend 26 minutes in the toilet. There, so, is, there is something called the breakaway principle, which is that yeah. we need to have focus time to really get yep. into an issue or problem and think about it. But then we actually need to break away from it and do something relaxing and give our mind a rest. Because you think about it, it's often when you're going for a walk, when you're in the shower, on the toilet, or when you're asleep, that your brain does its best creative work. And that's the unconscious mind at work, putting those ideas together and coming up with something unique and original. So it's, you need both. You need that really focused time without distractions Plus, then you need to take time out and give your brain a rest. Let it do yeah, its you, own creative you work. You have time to be fun, to be yes. and, and play. Just play. Yeah, and play. Just and play. And I guess that's why, Andrew, you, you actually have magic show in your workshop. <laughs> Is that one of the reasons? Maybe you want to explain to the uh, listeners, why do you actually have like magic shows? You do magic well, tricks. Okay, so, He's so, a frustrated magician. <laughs> <laughs> um, the reason, my background's education, and the last thing I want to do is bore people, and that's why I don't like the word training, because these days training implies a one-way de de delivery of skill. And so you can get that in the digital age without having to pay to go to a workshop. What I think is really important is we create a learning environment where people discover things for themselves, because when they discover it for themselves, they will remember it and apply it back in the workplace. Um, and, and everything else is free anyway. So what value can we add? We have to have an engaging environment. Now, look, every trainer says they're engaging, just like every hotel says they've got a comfortable bed. But I, I really believe we are engaging, <laughs> as Delphine's realised as she's been in many of these workshops. But it's more than just a gimmick. We know that when people are in a playful mode, we know that when things are gamified, we know that when people are freely discussing they are accessing a different part of their brain. The fear's gone, the control's gone, the pressure's gone, and it allows them to start exploring things that they wouldn't be able to do back at the workplace. So things that happen very fast in the workplace, um, a situation, we can, we can tease that out. And things that happen over a long time in the workplace, we can speed it up and show it. And so the idea of a gamified program or a simulation is so much more powerful than just a one-way delivery training program, which, as I said, you can get on YouTube for free. So it's more than just me being a frustrated magician. I want people mm -hmm. to discover things for themselves. It's more than just playing a who killed creativity with what weapon and how to get it back, uh, or the innovation race as we race around the world looking for innovation, which is our other book and maybe another workshop, uh, maybe another webinar. It is a genuinely about getting people to understand and discover for themselves what are the things that are blocking their creativity and what can they do about it. That will be much more powerful than just watching a YouTube video or, dare I say, reading a book. Yeah. Great, I mean, I've gone um, through a couple of workshops, quite a few workshops with you. And, you know, can you share with us an example of a success story of how an organization has gone from just being very stringent, very strict, very uptight about their culture to creating an environment of fun and they inject um, playtime, and they have um, more activities that bond the uh, workers together and how they actually start the ball rolling for them to start uh, getting creative. Could you share an example of that? 
I'll, I'll just start with um, extending the example I gave before of the organisation where uh, the CEO was quite controlling without realising it. And once we'd gone through this year and a half intervention process where uh, we went through this cycle of teaching people to start to open up to inquiry, to exploring, ideating different I around different ideas, um, bringing it back down to solutions and applications. So you can see how that ties in with you know, those, those um, seven killers that can block creative thinking in the, in the red. And then the, in the blue is the strategies that can open up creative thinking according to the design thinking process. And so once we've been through a year and a half of these workshops, coaching, and general just helping to change mindsets and attitudes and behaviours, really getting specific, uh, we had up to a 24% increase in people feeling that there was an improvement in the organisation culture, up to 14% increase in people feeling their teams were more creative, and up to 18% in individuals feeling that they had more creative capability. So they were quite significant results, and I think that was a definite um, success story. Not easy to do, because there were ingrained behaviours that were hard to change, but people started to see the possibilities and, and feel like there was a difference that's being made. I don't know if you can think of another example, Andrew. Well, I was going to do the reverse. We worked for a company with an amazing boss. It's a, a huge global company, an incredible boss that had an open office and, um, uh, you know, people loved him and he created a family environment and everyone was creative. And then he got promoted and was replaced by a company auditor from a country that's not known for being creative um, and all of a sudden it was really interesting over the period of over the period of a couple of months we watched these red dots come in it started with control which then led to fear people were too afraid to talk to him that led to pressure of people having to meet their numbers which led to insulation people would walk up the fire stairs and try and sneak into their office so no one would talk to them that unfortunately then within a couple of months led to a feeling of apathy where people said, well, what's the, what's the point? I can't even bother trying. That led to narrow-mindedness. I'm just going to focus on my job and nothing else. And, I, and really sadly, within about six months, that led to pessimism. Now, the good news is um, the company that sent him out there to do something realised that things were not going well. And he was told he had to get coached by us or fired, which is not the sort of thing you do to a CEO of a, of a country. <laughs> anyway, um, one of our team took him through a, a really nice coaching session. And it wasn't easy because it was... You know, he was clearly a numbers guy. That's what he was very good at. And he didn't have the EQ or the understanding to see what was happening with his team. And over a, over a period of a couple of months of coaching and really, you know, he was open to the feedback. Probably when you, when you threaten to get fired, you will be open to feedback. And it's sad that we have to get that far. But we then started to see the inquiry coming back, the exploration coming back, the solution coming back, and then the application so there is definitely a life cycle within an organisation, uh, even within ourselves, of, of either what we dare I say, the death of creativity. And there's also a life cycle of the, of the birth of creativity. And I think that's really important to understand and, and just be aware of watching that life cycle and asking yourself, well, where am I on it? If you're at the pessimism stage, time to probably get some help. Um, if you're at the control stage, watch out. You could be on a very quick slippery dip. But at the same side, for every one of those creative killers, as Jaya pointed out, there is a rescuer. And um, I think we need to, you know, using the, the who killed creativity metaphor, we, we, let, we let these um, fictional characters, please don't go pointing the finger. I know you're all thinking of your boss right now, um, <laughs> but please stop pointing the finger at someone and think of these fictional characters that are just freely wandering around our office, hanging around in the canteen. Uh, you know, the canteen can be a really toxic place where everyone bitch, bitches and gossips and moans. Or the canteen can be an amazing place where people uh, want to want to come up with Share creative ideas. ideas. And just to give you an example of a company that didn't have a lot of budget, this was a um, three-star company in Hong Kong, 100, 120 years old. So I'm not saying that they were bad, but they didn't have the office of uh, Google that could, you know, have a canteen that was a whole floor of five-star food. They couldn't even afford a coffee a coffee place. And they said to me, what can we do to get people bouncing into each other and collecting ideas off each other? Because we know that connection of people hitting each other from different departments is what makes Google so successful. And they've spent money on a canteen for that reason. But this company said, we can't spend that money. And I said, well, what was happening? And they said, well, everyone's just going out to buy coffee at lunch. And I said, can you afford $200 to buy an espresso machine? Just the, just the pod ones. And they went, oh, I suppose so. 
So we got, we got an espresso machine. They put it in the hallway because they didn't even have a canteen. Um, but all of a sudden, because, you know, people love a free coffee, all of a sudden, instead of people going out and spending a dollar on their McDonald's coffee or $5 on their Starbucks coffee, they started to gather around the coffee machine in the hallway. Now, that didn't cost the budget of Google, but it made a huge difference to the conversations that were being had because sometimes the best conversations are the casual ones that are happening around the fireside chat, around the water cooler, around the coffee machine. But you've got to create that environment. And, and if you've, you may not have the budget of Google, but, but go and have a look at your office. Is it a nice place to hang? Do people feel comfortable there? Or is it a place full of bitchiness and moaning and gossiping? It, it's up to us to create it, whether we've got the budget of Google or we've got the budget of this Hong Kong company. Do what you can with what you've got to make it a nice place to be, both physically, if possible, um, and, and definitely... Uh, I was going to say spiritually, but... Um, great. Okay. That, I mean, look, look some, some, some great points. Uh, look, the guys, we're getting overrun with questions and I'm just conscious of time. Um, you know, all of the stuff that you're talking about, some of the questions that you've already answered as we're going through. Um, but a really great point, um, and it's more just for you to... So can you talk about love and creativity? Huh? Lo no, can you talk no, about really. love and creativity? <laughs> Jaya, over to Jaya. Well, especially, yes, especially, married couple to talk about. <laughs> especially <laughs> given that of creativity or the love <laughs> and creativity, and creativity, especially given that you know most of us are spending uh, a significant amount more of our, of our time with our partners at the moment. So, uh, can you can you talk about how love and creativity? I can tell you fit? that you need to be very creative in a relationship. <laughs> To yeah, regardless you know, whether it's husband and wife or the relationship in the office, because where there's no love then there's no need to be creative. Um, and there's fear. I think yeah. there's no Ooh, love, there's like fear. I must have never had that question before, and I don't think I've ever been stumped on a question. So whoever asked that one... So this is all unscripted, you know. That's where the 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 energy energy for jumping. Yes, um, maybe what's the opposite of love, which is fear. Yeah, as, so. where there's love, there's acceptance, and there's openness, and there's respect. Mm. And all of those things are critical for creativity. So I, I agree, where there is a loving relationship, and there are all of those qualities, then you will feel much more free to express yourself and, and be creative, be your true self as well. You know, um, how you can have... You can well, just we wear have masks more. most of the time, because we're afraid yeah. of people not accepting us for who we are. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay, um, so, so guys, we're, we're sort of getting to the last five minutes. And I want to give you guys the opportunity to share um, a couple of things in terms of what the, you know, the types of things that you cover in your workshop, um, you know, and how that might benefit some of the, so, so give, us, give us a flavor of the types of things that you go through and the process you go through in order to actually get everybody being creative within the, you know, the, the workplace. Well, we're not short on resources, and we are, we are hoping that you will see that as you as you go onto the website. And I think, John, you're going to throw a few things up in a minute. But, um, you know, as I said, it's been really, really interesting. I'm just pulling up a slide. It's been really, really interesting um, giving people the opportunity to do these games and discuss ideas. Um, and here's an example of a um, – this is uh, – uh, a, a large company, uh, their innovation lab. I'm just pulling this slide up. Um, in Innovation Lab, playing the game. And as I said, in the days when we could be in the workshop, they're, 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 it's not a competitive game, but they're writing all over the game board, trying to look for creative ideas. And by having fun, doing some magic ticks, spending a day with them, keeping them off their phones, they've just got no shortage of ideas of all the things they're going to do. And to me, that's the most exciting thing about teaching is is watching, giving people the stimulus and the input and giving them the excitement and getting them to do it. Now, we realize we can't do these sort of things anymore, but as I said, we're not, we're not short of content in terms of what we're doing. So we have um, uh, created, uh, we're now creating an online version of the game. We've got a lot of um, courses that we're now putting online so people can go and do independent learning if their boss won't pay for them to do it. Um, and I think John will throw up a slide. It's all on our uh, website, whokillcreativity.com. We've got the book, the audio book, and the new one, which I think we'd really like you to look at is The Wisdom Destinations, which is an audio journey with a leader's guide where you can listen to the book, listen to an interview, listen to a story, and then download a leader's guide and take it through your, go through that with your team. Um, it's about 90 minutes long, but it's a nice, simple thing if you can't get together as a whole workshop group or you can't afford us to fly over um, on, a, on a chartered plane, then the Wisdom Destinations Who Killed Your Creativity, I think is a nice, simple thing that people can do to follow this up and start 
getting that creativity flowing. And I, I don't know if you made it clear that um, we are delivering these workshops online. So we have been doing that successfully already since everything was shut down with COVID. And um, it's translated quite well. So we make sure we have lots of um, chats, send people off into chat rooms, the same way we would facilitate discussions in a workshop. Um, we're using resources where people can draw pictures and share them on the screen. We're using polls. We, so we're keeping it highly interactive still and a creative learning process. And what we do in that workshop is, well, we have several versions. So one might be the game board where we're helping people to identify. Oh, yeah, John, John, can you go to the next slide? We're going, we were just jumping oh, back and forth. I'm just looking at John's <laughs> slide there. Go to the, so that, yeah. So these are all the resources that we've, as I said, we're not short of being creative ourselves. We apologize. We quite um, do a lot, uh, but yes, we, we really appreciate you. There's lots of different things you can look at. So, so yeah, just to finish with the, the workshop, we, we have that um, identification stage in the workshop. And then we go on to look at practical skills and strategies. And we actually follow through a case study of an organization that has used this creative process in real life. And we talk about how they applied each of the skills and tools that we teach. Um, and then we give um, our, our participants the opportunity to go through the creative process for themselves, for their organization. And what challenges are they facing and how can they resolve these issues using the tools we've taught them? So it's a, it's a really comprehensive approach. Well, it leads, really in, it, leads in, it leads into design thinking. As I said, a lot of people want to mm -hmm. jump straight into design thinking, but they haven't done the necessarily homework beforehand. So we're not going to try and compete with Stanford or IDEO. We, we think that this is an area that needs to be done prior to embarking on that design thinking. So I think the resources are up on the screen at the moment. As I said, no shortage of books, audio books, the right. wisdom destinations. And John, if you want to pop back to that wisdom destinations um, screen, Delphine twisted my arm to see if we could get the publishers to give a discount off this. And they have significantly reduced the price and they've then added a discount on the reduced price. So it really is the, a couple of cups of coffee to, to download this audio book. John, you said you're, you're too lazy to read and a 300 page yeah. book is is a little bit of work. for you, John. Oh, look, you, you know, I, I do a lot of driving around, so it, it, it was very, very easy. Um, mm -hmm. highly, rec highly recommend it, guys. Um, we're getting close to time. There's a ton of questions that we've captured in the Q&A. Um, I might ask for a little bit more of your time post this, Andrew, just to film the answers mm -hmm. to some of those questions uh, at a later stage, and then we can send that out to everybody as well. Well, also, they can follow us on LinkedIn. I mean, there's plenty of ways to keep in touch with us. There's the TED Talk, the YouTube TED Talk I did. Um, and, and yeah, please all, you know, 150 people, you can connect to us, both of us on LinkedIn, but we've both got our own, so you can choose which one you'd prefer more. The, the Beauty or the Brains, which is probably Jaya and Jaya. Um, <laughs> but yes, there's lots of different you, ways you to said keep it, in not touch me. with us. And we're sorry we don't get to hear from you all, and we're sorry we're not in person. Um, but, but this is the best we can do at the moment and hopefully the digital world will allow us to really build a relationship with all of you and keep the conversation going. We will respond to you.